not yet. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar, which is Supercharge Your ASP.NET Core Applications. For today's webinar, I would like to introduce Kevin Griffin. Kevin does a lot of development with .NET and web development, and he's got some great stuff in this webinar for you. Hello, Kevin. Oh, I can mute. OK, I was like, wait uh, a second, I can't hear you. There we go. Now we're wait. good. All right, take me backstage. We got to redo. Start, cut the feed. <laughs> Let's restart this from scratch. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rachel. Hello. So glad to be here. Great, great, great to have you. So for the next hour, you're going to tell us uh, several things about ASP.NET, four major areas which uh, are going to help people make their apps better. I'm very excited about this because I, I got a little preview, right? Because I know you, right? Yeah. So that's good stuff, you know? So. Or my goal is they, they screw up their app so badly, they have to call me for consulting. Either way, it's a win-win, right? It's a win-win, yeah. <laughs> so sounds good. Okay, well, I'll let you take it from here. You could just get started. Uh, before we do that, though, really quick, if you have any questions, attendees, ask them in the chat. We'll try to answer as we go along. And then there may be some time for questions at the end. This session is being recorded and it is available on YouTube. Uh, we'll make the URL available later as well. So uh, with that, I think that's all the real housekeeping that we need to know about this right now. And we could take it away. All righty. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Again, wherever you are in the world. Um, so this is actually a brand new talk. And I'm going to say the prayer over a new talk that nothing goes wrong. And we're going to knock on wood. Uh, but I'm very excited to be with you all today. Uh, a little bit about me, if you've never seen me before um, in my travels. Uh, my name is Kevin Griffin. I'm a Microsoft MVP uh, for a lot of times. And my primary focus isn't ASP.NET, ASP.NET Core. I've made that jump with everyone else a couple of years ago. And I love deploying applications of Microsoft Azure. So when you see me out and about, I'm usually talking about something in that umbrella of building web applications, web services, and deploying them to the cloud. If you like to talk to me for any reason afterwards, uh, Twitter is usually the best place to go, at one Kev Griff, or just say nice things about me, I'll send you a cookie. And uh, I also have my site, consultwithgriff.com. Now we're gonna come back to this a little bit later, but I'm also the author of Sigmar Mastery, which is everything you need to know about building real-time web applications in .NET. Uh, but that's not why you're here. You're here because we wanna talk about ASP.NET Core. And let's talk about the where this talk came from as an idea, because I spend a lot of time in ASP.NET Core and I'll go out and I'll speak at conferences and user groups, uh, well, more so before COVID and the end of times. But we were starting to bounce back. And as I go out to these events and I talk to folks about building applications in ASP.NET Core, I'll say, well, are you using this feature or that feature? And I get these blank stares because there are features that are new in ASP.NET Core that people just are not aware of. And I, I really relate ASP.NET to maybe a trail mix. And depending on the the type of trail mix you're getting, there's a lot of different stuff in there and some some good, some bad, some indifferent. And what I wanna talk about are the, the pieces of ASP.NET Core that you might not be aware of, maybe you have heard about, but you haven't played with in your own applications. Uh, and we're gonna dive in and show you a couple of examples, answer your questions to the best of my ability. And yeah, let, so let's start there. I have four major topics that we're gonna hit within the hour. And the first one is ASP.NET Core health checks. And what we'll do is we'll do an explanation of what health checks is. We'll dive into some code and show you a real running example. Uh, so health checks were added to ASP.NET Core. I, I wanna say not that long ago, but it's probably been longer than 
I really expect. And they were added to solve a core fundamental issue. Uh, so let's think about it this way. You have your application living out there in the internet, the internet, wherever it might be. And your inner, your application doesn't exist by itself. It usually relates to or requires a variety of other services. So you might have SQL Server, you might have Postgres, you might have MySQL, uh, you might have some sort of storage that might be S3, it might be Azure Storage, or you have uh, some sort of RevMQ or Redis. You have a lot of different services that make your application run. And it's kind of amazing that anything works because you have so many dependencies that need to run successfully every single time a request comes in or a process takes place. All right, well, when the, all these services are running correctly, we have a term for that. And that term is, it's healthy. It's a healthy running application. And this is good. This is where we want to be. This is where you want to be from five o'clock in the afternoon until nine in the next morning. You don't want any issues overnight when you're trying to do other things. But stuff happens. You have to remember that all these services were written by humans. And not all humans are as good of developers as you are. Sometimes things go wrong. Uh, and I'm just picking on SQL Server here. But a lot of times when I have an application problem, it's because of something dumb in SQL Server. Like SQL Server goes down for uh, a second or two, or I try to make a bad query and I lock the entire database. It doesn't matter what, who did what, when, where, but something goes down in your infrastructure and you probably know as well as I do, when one thing goes down in your stack, well, the entire stack goes down. It doesn't matter that Redis is still running perfectly. It doesn't matter that Azure Storage is still running perfectly. If the database goes down or any of the required services, your site is down and it can't recover until everything recovers. And we also have a term for this. <laughs> well, it's, it's a curse word, but we're not gonna say that. The real term we want is unhealthy. It means things are not running in a healthy manner. So, all right, well, we have two terms. We have healthy and we have unhealthy. And let's relate these to health checks inside of ASP.NET Core. We can, there's a mechanism already built into ASP.NET Core that will tell you or allow you to set up regular checks that look at all your different dependencies and tell you whether or not they're healthy or unhealthy. Um, and there's also another state called degraded. So maybe things are slowing down, not running as perfectly as you want them to be. But health checks can go look at all these different services and tell you whether you're good or you're not as good as you want to be. Adding them in ASP.NET Core is just as simple as saying add health checks. And if you've done any work in ASP.NET Core, you know you, you go add your dependencies and then you wire up your, uh, your routing pipeline. So if we're in our configure uh, services method, I just say I want to add health checks. And then there's a variety of extension methods on here that now none of these add SQL Server, add Redis, add Azure Blob Search. These aren't built into ASP.NET Core. No, <laughs> I'm gonna show you a really cool tool that gives all of these to you for absolutely free. Well, what we can do is we can tell ASP.NET Core, whenever we wanna check the health of our application, well, it should go check SQL Server. It should go check Redis Cache. It should go check Azure Blob Storage and make sure all of those are running the way that we expect them to. I can also add things in here that uh, will publish results for me. So if I want to publish results or provide an endpoint for application insights, I can do that as well. Uh, if you're running Docker and you know Docker has uh, health checks built into it automatically, you can point your health checks to um, the Docker endpoint. So if you're running a variety of containers in uh, say a Swarm or in Kubernetes, I don't talk that gibberish, but it, you want to know the health of any one node in your infrastructure, the, 
you know, Kubernetes Docker Swarm, they can go look at the endpoint and say, oh, this is a healthy node, this is an unhealthy node. And it can recuperate from there. We can also, uh, so we can do these health checks all day long, but it's kind of worthless unless we're exposing that in some manner. So we can add endpoints in our, our routing services to say, well, if I go to slash health, give me the, the healthy or unhealthy state of the application. And this works really well. There's this fantastic open source library, uh, ASP core diagnostics.healthchecks, uh, have the link up here. And this is also in my GitHub repo because this is what they're, what they put in the docs. If you go to the ASP.NET core docs, this is listed in there as the way to go if you need to support one of, it's like two, three dozen different services. So don't write this code yourself even though I'm going to show you an example of how to write the code yourself. So let's dive into a demo. I want to show you what this all looks like. I'm going to bring up a writer. I have a health checks demo. And I'll start with my startup CS to give you kind of an idea of what's going on. We always start and configure services. And we tell ASP.NET that we want to use health checks. Now there's no NuGet packages installed. This is the base. ASP on a core package that you get. And I'm using that uh, open source library I just talked about to connect the SQL server. And this SQL server is up and running right now, uh, person demo database. And I also have another check that I custom written called is website up check. And this is just going to go see if a website is responding with the 200 OK. If it is, it's good. If it's not, it's, it's bad. Now let's just scroll down a little bit more. And I have a registered endpoint in the same ASP on the core application uh, to slash health. And I've added some options here. And this is part of that open source package for, for health checks. And what it does in particular is it spits everything out as a JSON object. Um, if I didn't have this, and we'll show it both ways, the health checks will just tell you healthy or are unhealthy and that's not necessarily as useful as you would want it to be. Let's go ahead and run this application. Oh, it's opening in another page. So I'm going to bring my tab over. So we'll see hello world. Yay. Let's go ahead and full screen. Where's my all right. We'll say health. When I call health, ASP.NET Core is going to go perform the health checks on my behalf. And it's going to come back and tell me my SQL server is healthy. And it took, uh, what, 38, what is this, microseconds, uh, milliseconds to respond. Cool. Everything's running as quickly as I would want it to be. Now I have this other one called is website up. And it's reporting the website is running. And it took. Uh, half a second to, to respond. So cool. Everything's good there as well. Now let's show you real fast what happens if I were to remove this help checks option. So just slash help all by itself. Rerun the app. Just refresh. It's just going to tell me healthy. Now, this isn't useful at all, especially as you start adding additional services, because, well, if it's unhealthy, what part of it's unhealthy? You kind of want more information from this endpoint than what it's going to give you by default. But no worries. Let's go ahead and undo our check here. The database, let's just assume, uh, so I don't have my, my database server up. I forgot to load that. But let me go just turn the database off because that's an easy way to make that check fail, right? And I forgot to load everything. I forgot to load everything. All right. We'll give that a second to do, do the same. So let me show you is website checkup. We'll load this file. And this is a... A uh, special class you build, uh, you inherit from iHealthCheck. 
And it gives you this method you have to implement called uh, check health async. And what you do here is you go check to see if you can do the work on the dependency that you would expect to be able to do. Uh, in our case, I want to go to my website. I want to see how long it takes to make that call. And I want to see whether or not that call was successful. So I have three cases for calling this website. First is I call the website, it was successful, but and the time was under two seconds. Now two seconds is kind of my threshold. If that's good, then we say we're healthy and the website is running successfully. Now, if it's over two seconds, but I still got a 200 okay, I'm, I'm good, but I'm not great. So I can return a results uh, of degraded. Now, my website is blazing fast, so I can't force this even if I wanted to. So we'll just pretend that this would happen if my website was down for any reason. Uh, and then finally, if the website's down at all for any reason. And so basically, if I get a status code that's not a 200 okay, we're going to return unhealthy and this will report back that the website is down. All right, cool. We are, we're going to stop the server. Yes, I want to stop SQL server. Yes, I want to stop SQL server. And what this should do now is if I, um, was I running the app? Yep, I'm running. All right, so you notice it's going to spin here for a second. It comes back as unhealthy. So it came back as unhealthy specifically because SQL Server came back as unhealthy. And it's also going to tell me why. And this is all the, the defaults. And the defaults is because it can't connect to the SQL Server, which is an obvious problem. And it tried for up to the timeout to, to do that work. Uh, and there might be other reasons why your application might be down. You could test specific queries. You, you can do anything you want to if you want to override that particular health check. But this is what's really interesting about the health checks feature overall is you can get this detailed information back from ASP.NET Core and it'll tell you exactly what you need to do in order to, to move on. So there you go. Uh, so this is number one in our group of things that are built into ASP.NET Core. Um, what I want to do in between every section is if there are any questions, I would love to answer them as we're on the topic. If not, I'll, I'll move on to the next thing. All right, I, let's see, I have the chat over here as well. So I don't see any questions, so we will just move on. We can always backtrack if we need to. All right. Oops. All right, so next thing that we want to talk about in ASP.NET Core that I wish I saw more people using is this concept of background workers. And let's talk about this from a high level. You have your application out there running and it does a lot of work. And hopefully there's some work you're not doing a matter of factly. Um, I'll give you some examples. If you have any place in your application that needs to send email, you should not be doing that at the time the someone presses a button or calls an API endpoint. Those are things that are letter, better left for later. And when I say later, I mean something else should be doing that work. Uh, sending emails, if you're charging credit cards, if you're cleaning up storage, processing queues. There's a variety of things that don't necessarily need to happen immediately at the time that a web service gets called. Now we call those background tasks. And there's already ways to do this, and I've done all of them. Uh, one of my favorites, kind of up until now, still still a really good library, is Hangfire. Uh, I've seen this implemented in a lot of different client applications. Uh, Hangfire works really well. Uh, the, what, the big problem I have with Hangfire is that it makes you conform to a couple standards in your application. It makes it difficult to 
uh, offset that work to other background background workers. Uh, but it gives you a really good interface, shows you exactly what's happening, uh, reporting errors, all that cool stuff. Uh, next, you have Quartz.net, which is like a scheduling job library for .NET. It's a little bit lower level than what you would get with Hangfire, but it works just as well. Uh, I've built my own services on Azure Logic Apps, Azure Functions, using uh, using queues and Azure Storage. There's uh, a variety of different ways to solve this problem, but in the not too recent past the ASP.NET team has added this new concept to ASP.NET called iHosted Service. And I'm talking about this in the context of ASP.NET Core, but it's not necessarily a, a ASP.NET feature. It's more of a .NET feature, but primarily used inside of ASP.NET Core applications. And this is a worker, a service that lives inside the, the host of ASP.NET Core. ASP.NET Core will ensure that it gets started and it will handle dependency injection and all that good stuff for your hosted service. And this is great for background services. Uh, I'll give you an example, a real world example, is I had a client where we were using Hangfire and Hangfire out of the box, if you're just doing truly open source, you have to use SQL Server as your backend. And one of the problems with using SQL Server as a backend for anything is that you have some inherent latency just in pulling for, for new information. Uh, so we had a mission critical feature that uh, a request would come in and we needed to process it immediately, but putting it into Hangfire and then Hangfire coming back within a couple seconds was too much of a delay for our application. Even though the, the you know, start to finish result was four or five seconds, it was still too much time. We needed that to be within half a second of, of everything occurring. So I ended up rewriting that entire task where we still bring in, uh, the data still comes in through our API, we drop it into a queue, and then we have an iHosted service that pulls the queue repeatedly and does it in a way where it's not blocking uh, any threads or anything like that. Well, we did this and we our performance went out the roof because instead of waiting for the hang fire delay to pull SQL Server to see if there was a task to do and then it going to do that task. Instead, we had something that could work a little bit lower level that was already built in ASP.NET Core and basically allowed us to remove hang fire as a dependency from the application. Uh, there's two ways to use iHosted service. The way I recommend for most people is to use background service. Uh, so you create a class that implements background service. And background service is an abstraction of iHosted service. So they, they work relatively the same way. Uh, the background service implementation gives you, this is a little bit more hand-holding for you. So you have one method, execute async, and this gets called at the moment your application starts and all the services get started along with your app. And the two key things I love about this is I don't have to worry about ensuring that these services get called. And two, I have ASP.NET Core or .NET dependency injection built into the platform. So any services that I need from other as aspects of my app, they get injected automatically. I can go do my work as needed. The other way to do this, if you wanna do it by hand, is to implement iHosted service, which has a start and a stop method uh, along with it. So, and it passes in cancellation tokens. So think about you're using iHosted service, you might set a timer and that timer every five, 10 seconds goes and does some work. And you just, you're gonna do that for as long as your application is ever gonna live. Uh, if it's a web application, it should never shut down, right? It should just keep going forever and ever. But if you're running this in some other context, maybe uh, a .NET console application or a Windows service, you might have these cases where you need things to shut down gracefully. Well, you have a stop method that you can handle and you can clean up after yourself. The setup for this is the same, whether you're using background service or you're using iHosted service, um, you can just 
go into your configure services in ASP.NET Core and tell it add hosted service, give it the name of the service, and it does all the work. Now let's look at a demo next. I have another application here, and all this is in GitHub. I'll give you the GitHub before everything's said and done. Uh, and this is called, let's see, generate new user worker. And let's start with the setup. Uh, in my configure services, I've added a line to add a hosted service, and this goes at the end of all my other dependency crap. And I want to tell it, I want to create and run a hosted service called generate new user worker, which I have implemented over here. So generate new user worker. I'm implementing background service because it's a little bit easier. I'm going to take two injections, uh, an I HTTP client factory, because I'm going to make an external HTTP request. And I'm also bringing a logger because I want to log some information out to wherever ASP.NET Core is going to log stuff. So I get that benefit of dependency injection by using this worker. Then I uh, overridden my async or execute async method, where what this is going to do is just forever, <laughs> it's going to uh, go through and make a call to an external web service called randomuser.me. And it's going to get back what we call a, a new user. And that new user R, we're going to spit out to the log their name, their first name, and their last name. Uh, if you've never looked at random user uh, me. This is really cool if you need to generate fake data for any purpose uh, because it's random It's random user information. It gives you uh, avatars for profile pictures. Uh, it's really cool, really useful, really fast, and really free. <laughs> so we go do that work. We spit back our user. And then we're going to delay for a couple seconds. And we're going to just go do the same thing over and over again. And this is going to happen in the background of my primary ASP.NET Core application. So let's run this. All right, so this is running. Now, if we just watch the bottom down here, I'm going to zoom in a little. We can see the logger kicks in that made the call to random user me. And got a new user, Pablo Jolly. And if we just wait every couple seconds, it's going to keep doing the same thing. And this is specifically working in my background service. Now, relate this to something that's probably a little bit more useful. Uh, I could be processing a queue, looking for anything new on a queue, going and doing that work, coming back, waiting for more messages. Uh, I could be cleaning up storage. This is, <laughs> I'm really listing off things I use background services for. Uh, that might be a Unicode that the that the console can't spit out. Um, but the background service is just going to keep doing all this work in the background. And before someone asks me, uh, what happens if this were to crash? Well, it, it crashes the application. It's living inside of uh, ASP.NET Core. So when you have an exception here, you get an unhandled exception in the application. And it doesn't, uh, it ends up taking the entire app down with it. So you can add, do some due diligence on your own, add a try catch, make sure you're catching exceptions on, on your end, reporting them. Uh, but usually when a background service uh, has an exception, you probably have a bigger issue and you probably need to reset everything anyway. Uh, also, what happens if you're not, uh, looping through anything. What if your ace execute async just runs and it completes? Well, it it gets cleaned up and go, goes away because it's not doing any more work. It doesn't have a reason to live. Um, that might not be the best way to phrase that, but it doesn't live anymore. So that's background workers. Uh, any questions about background workers? Or any questions from what we were doing earlier? Ooh, there's a lot of chatter. Anything important? Uh, 
Ah, da, 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 da. All right, let me let me kind of scroll. Let me scroll up a little. Uh, are there security concerns with reporting health status? Oh, all right. Let me, um, let me go ahead and attach some of these while we're at it. So we're back on health checks. Um, you have a better option than add SQL Server. Uh, not quite sure what the, the context of that question was. Uh, are there security concerns with reporting health status? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you could you can still put that behind the behind protected endpoints. So you add a low authentication to it. Uh, you can also uh, control who has access to it. It doesn't need to be a broadly um, open endpoint to the world. Uh, how would a customer response object integrate with uh, Kubernetes that expects a response code? I know that Kubernetes is called Kubernetes. That is the extent of my knowledge of Kubernetes. I wish I could answer that a little bit better. Um, uh, what does Add Application Insights Publisher do exactly? Um, that is a great question. So uh, in Application Insights, you can set up a health check monitoring endpoint directly uh, to the app. And I have a to-do for another application. That's why I added it, because I've been playing along with it. Um, so you can have application insights check on the the basically the health of your application. Uh, let's see. I'm going to scroll down so I can get on to the next thing. Uh, what's the benefit of doing this stuff in the background opposed to doing it right away with asynchronous logic? Um, so yeah, that's a great question. Um, it used to be you were you're basically tying up. Um, uh, requests and sockets. So if you have a busy application, your your sole primary focus for a web server should be get that request in and out. So get a response back to a person as quickly as possible. Uh, you have certain things that could happen. Let's use sending email as a great example. Sending email is not a critical service. Uh, so there's no point from request coming in to response going out that and that we have to ensure that that email gets sent immediately. Let me dive into that a little bit deeper. Yes, that email needs to get sent, but it doesn't matter if that email gets sent right now or if it gets sent two or three seconds from now or even a minute or two from now um, because you're going to send it to your SMTP server, wherever you're sending your emails, um, and it's going to go into a queue. So why should you delay getting a response back to a client for a thing that's going to go into a queue anyway? Um, also, what if it fails? I use Mandrill. I've used, um, uh, crap, I'm forgetting, uh, Postmark. They have hiccups in their APIs all the time. What if it fails? What if it fails and you don't have proper error handling in your request? You're now sending an exception back to a user for something that was outside your control and really had nothing to do with your application. If that was in a queue, so a queue made the call to Mandrill and Mandrill failed for any reason, sent the response back, uh, you would just queue it up and try again later. Uh, and it doesn't have any impact on the immediate clients. Uh, so there's, I, I mean, this actually could be an entire session all on its own. Uh, why is it necessary to add the 10 second delay? Uh, that's just because I don't want to DDoS their, their service. Um, and I want to show that my, my application does something, it waits a couple seconds, does it again. Um, all right, I'm going to move on. There's, there's a lot of, a lot of communication here. We're actually going to come back to this workers example in a second. Um, because we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is Signal R. And that's not because I have a Signal R course. Let's talk about what Signal R is. Uh, let's talk about the use case for Signal R or a use case for Signal R. And this is something I talk about in the course. You're just getting a very abbreviated version of it. 
Uh, let's imagine you have a server, you have a set of servers, and the server is what we call the uh, the master of all state. So it, everything comes into the server and uh, we make requests and we get back responses. So let's say we have a server that we're buying stuff from and a variety of clients are connected to the server, they're, they're buying things. And I have an inventory of thingamajigs uh, and I only have 10 in stock. So client A goes to the server and says, I like the, the product information for a thingamajig. And the server sends back a response like, oh, cool, I have 10 of them in stock. At the same time, a, another client, uh, client E, goes and does the same thing. How many thingamajigs do you have? We have 10. Now, client A goes, 10 thingamajigs, I am sold. I want to buy all 10. So it allows this because there are 10 in, in the inventory. We set it up so they can buy all 10. Inventory goes to zero and client A is satisfied. They move on with their life. But you have client E sitting over here and they are still on a page that says that there were 10 thingamajigs in inventory. So they just, they don't want to be greedy. They don't need all 10, they just want two. So they go back to the server and they say, well, I just want to buy two thingamajigs. Well, the server obviously can't fulfill that request. It's going to error out, send back a, oh, we're sorry. There's, there's not enough in stock to, to maintain uh, your request. And everyone is sad. What if there were a slightly better way to solve this type of problem? We still have our server. Our server has 10 thingamajigs in memory, all of our clients connect, our clients A and client E connect, they get the, the 10. But instead of just sitting there and waiting for the user to do something, in the back end, we're connecting to the server through a WebSocket, through um, uh, server send events, or even long polling. There's a lot of different ways for a client to, to communicate. And that server is going to stay in constant communication with us about the state of thingamajigs. So now when client A goes and buys 10 thingamajigs and it changes the state of the inventory, the server in turn is going to send a notification down to everyone else that's connected, telling them, hey, there are now zero thingamajigs for, uh, uh, in our inventory. So everyone now has a constant up-to-date version of the state of the application. Um, and this is done not just uh, on major web browsers, but it can also be on mobile devices, uh, Raspberry Pis, uh, across the entire uh, you know, ecosystem that runs .NET. We can use SignalR to maintain this real-time communication. So yay, .NET man. Uh, now, like I said, I have an entire course that talks about this, but I want to give you one of my favorite examples from the course, and it's using background workers. So I'm going to load a third demo, and this demo is going to look very similar. We have our generate new user worker, and I've added a separate section down here at the bottom uh, in use endpoints where uh, we're setting up what's called a hub. So in Signal R, we have this concept of hubs. A hub is a central connect connection point for clients. So anyone that connects to our clients and they want real time updates uh, from that client or from that server, they they connect to a hub. Uh, think of hubs in a similar vein to maybe MVC controllers or Web API controllers. So I have a hub right here. And a hub is a hub because it implements hub. Uh, and there's a variety of things we can do inside of the hub, but just for the sake of time, let's, let's talk through these. Uh, I'm exposing two methods to any client that connects to my hub. One is called start notify and the other one's called in notify. And what these methods do is they add me to a group, uh, a signal R group that will get notified anytime a new user is generated. Now, I don't want to just spam everyone that 
new users are being created every couple of seconds. I only want the folks that need to know or want to know about that information to subscribe to those events. So when you connect, you have, we'll have two buttons, start notifications and notifications. And when I click on either of those, it's going to call into one of these two uh, uh, background methods and they'll add my particular connection to that group, notify me. Now let's, let's watch this first and then we'll go into the background service. So here we go. Let's go ahead and let's create two instances of this window. Now in one instance, I'm going to say start notifications. And notice how it's listening. Now we just wait a second. So Billy Phillips joins and I get a message that Billy Phillips has, has joined. Uh, but notice only the right client got that notification, the left client Got nothing, uh, Erica. Now I'll go back to the left and I'll turn on notifications there. Now all this work is still happening in a background worker. So we are processing queues, we are sending emails, we are doing all this work. And I want to send state updates to any client that's connected that needs to know about the new state. Now watch this, if I end notifications on the left, well, we'll wait for one more. Yeah, one more person. Um, I don't know how to pronounce the name. So the left didn't get that notification because we unsubscribed from those notifications from the server. But everything keeps working in the background service. And what's the background service doing? Now, this is the exact same code that we had had before. Uh, the only big difference is that I'm injecting through dependency injection an iHub context, and the iHub context gives me a reference to my SignalR hub and all my connected clients. And I can use this whenever I need to, to go tell all my clients that I want to notify them. So all the connected clients who are in the group notify me, I want to tell them that there's a new user and I want to pass in the, oh, let me do that. I want to pass in the data for that new user that I'm getting back from the, the API. Over on the client, it's a just simple JavaScript. You could also, you should write this in TypeScript be, behind Webpack or something else. Uh, but you can do this in raw JavaScript if you want to. Uh, what we're doing is we're creating a connection to our SignalR hub and SignalR will automatically take care of, should this be a WebSocket connection? Should it be server send events? Should it be long polling? Uh, what I love about SignalR versus doing this by hand, so if you wanted to do WebSockets by hand, you could and it would work just fine. The, the problem is maybe you're connecting through a proxy or a VPN that doesn't allow WebSocket connections. Um, you don't have a fallback in those cases. SignalR, you do. There's always a way to fall back to long polling and long polling will work through every VPN, every proxy that you have. It'll work on the oldest browser you could possibly find uh, as long as that oldest browser is IE6, which some of you probably are still supporting. Well, on that connection, we we set up event handlers. So there's an event handler for when I have the new user event that I get from the server. So here I'm issuing the event or emitting the event. And here I'm handling the event. And when that happens, I get the new user object and I do some fancy JavaScript HTML work and I insert uh, that into an un unordered list. Now I have two other methods here that if you care uh, for clicking the button, so start events, um, start notify and notify. Now what we're doing in those cases is we're sending the, uh, we're emitting the event to the server that we would like to start receiving notifications or we like to start uh, not receiving, or please stop giving us notifications. And then finally we have a start down here at the bottom that initiates everything. This does the, should it be WebSockets, service and events, or long polling? Um, but when this all works perfectly, we get the list of names. 
Uh, and so I talk about this in any performance talk with SignalR because it, what we're doing is we're putting less stress on the, the server by not having to make as many requests to it. Uh, I recently, very recently, within, let's say within the past two months, uh, did a consulting engagement where the there was a notification icon at the top of the screen. And all it was supposed to tell you is you got new messages, uh, someone did something in the application that you needed to know about. And they wanted it to be real time. Well, real time for them was every second, it was going to the server, hitting an endpoint, asking for the latest notifications. And they actually, they optimized that pretty well. Like it was as fast as it could be, but they were doing thousands and thousands and thousands of requests per second across the entire infrastructure for calls that would never return anything. So they were using system resources for calls that never were beneficial to, to the user. Now we took four or five hours, we ripped that out, we replaced it with signal R. So when events were emitted in the system, we would make the notification to the individual clients. And it dramatically dropped the number of requests that these servers were having to manage over time. So there's a real benefit of adding SignalR to your environments now. So when you have a use case where you need that real-time state updates from, from the server, you already have a mechanism in place to, to handle that. All right. Home stretch. So again, SignalR, uh, I have a course on it, yay. Uh, any questions about SignalR? Uh, let's see, using the same code, but SignalR servers on Azure, more stable than SignalR. That's a, um, yes. Uh, so I have an entire section of the course on it. Azure SignalR service is really good because it takes the load of even having to manage the web sockets off of your server. So it's managed by Azure servers and then it will proxy the calls to your, your services. Um, that works really well. The biggest problem I have with Azure SignalR service is pricing. I don't think it's priced accordingly for production applications. Um, I think it's really easy to, to get an expensive bill in Azure SignalR service, even though it's a great service to begin with. Um, the, the fallback and what I do on plenty of applications and it works fine, is we'll use Redis Cache as a backplane for SignalR and we'll just manage, uh, we'll just scale up the number of nodes that we're managing. Uh, that works just fine. Um, uh, what if I want to send the message back to the client once they reconnect? Uh, what's the possible way? There's lifecycle events built into SignalR um, so we can detect reconnections on the client. And normally what we do in real apps is when that happens, we'll just say, we don't trust any of our current state. Please tell us everything that we need to know. Um, how many strategies do we have, like pulling, long pulling, et cetera? Uh, there's three. You have web sockets, you have server send events, and you have long pulling. Um, how many connections can we make with SignalR? It depends. <laughs> it depends on how much, uh, basically, how big of a system you're running on. Um, but we're talking tens, uh, hundreds of thousands. Um, it, it depends on how many resources if, because every connection basically has to be managed in memory, uh, because you need to have a reference to the connection, uh, it is possible to, to run out of connections. I have done that, but I did it in the worst possible way <laughs> that wouldn't commonly happen in the application. Um, so uh, actually, I, I have it in the course where I talk about that scenario exactly. Uh, how to build Zite board with SignalR uh, or chat apps. I hate chat apps. That's why we're doing background work, for example, in SignalR. Um, I don't know what Zite board is. So maybe that's a question for, for offline. Uh, does SignalR use long pulling? It can. Uh, if you fall back to that, it can use long pulling. Uh, let's see. Oh, I missed a couple up here. Um, Sam, are you scheduled to launch another course on Udemy? Actually, yeah, I'm working on one on View and ASP.NET Core single page applications. Um, uh, all right, and then, all right, I think we're good on SignalR for now. So I'm going to jump into my last topic and then we'll, we'll bring it all home. All right, all right, SignalR Mastery. 
uh, caching. So uh, caching caching is not a new topic, but the caching infrastructure in ASP.NET Core, ASP.NET Core, is dramatically different than the caching infrastructure that was in, say, ASP.NET Full Framework. Uh, but let's talk about caching in general, why caching is a good idea. And this goes along with things like background workers and just, you know, why would you even want to do this? So let's imagine your application talks to SQL Server. A uh, request comes in and it's a big one. We're asking for all, all users in, in the database, but all users in the database where we're filtering based off criteria. We're joining with three other tables. We're not doing what's called a quick query. So when this happens, we have to go to SQL Server, wait the couple seconds that it takes for that response to come back. We do something with it, and we send the response to whoever needs it. And there's nothing wrong with that approach, but this is what slows down applications. You, We put a lot of emphasis on SQL Server and SQL Server performance, but sometimes as developers, we just ask SQL Server to do things that it cannot do quickly. Uh, and I say that as a person that does that daily. I ask SQL Server to do things that it can't do quickly. Um, well, what if we make queries and they, or we go get data and that data doesn't change very often? What if we could just put that data aside? We know what the response is going to be. So we put the response aside for a rainy day. Well, that's what cache is. So the same scenario, we get a request coming in. Now we have made this request before, so we put everything into cache. So we'll go to our cache, pull the data out, and send back the cache response. Now this doesn't just speed up one query. We need to think about this in the aggregate. 50,000 queries to the database are now replaced by a single lookup and a cache. So the cache is always going to be faster for reads than it will be from a SQL server because this, the, uh, oh, actually we'll talk about why here in a moment. So the cache is always going to be uh, faster for, for reads because it's simpler data. Let's scale this out a little bit more. Maybe I don't have just one ASP on a core app. Maybe I have a lot. So I'm doing that Kubernetes thing. I'm doing that Docker Swarm thing. Or if you're like me, you're in Azure App Services and you have multiple app services running. Um, we don't want to have caches individually on every instance of ASP.NET Core. What would be more beneficial is to have a shared cache like Redis Server. So what if that same request comes in and in instead of the each individual server going to SQL Server to make the query, which would work, but would get drastically slower for each uh, server that we add to our cluster. Uh, what if we put that result set into Redis Cache and each individual ASP.NET Core server could just go to Redis Cache and say, well, does Redis Cache have the data that I need? If it does, we just grab it and go. Uh, and let's talk about invalidation. What if one server realizes that the data needs to get invalidated. Well, I invalidate it in one place, and now every other server benefits from not having stale data on it locally. Uh, caches, in the terms that we're going to talk about, are really simple. Uh, they're basically key value stores or dictionaries. So for uh, any one key, there is one value. So if I have a key, all right, user and a user ID. Well, that's going to point to a string or a, an array of bytes. And it's going to get me back um, the data. This is what makes caching so fast is it's not having to load a table in memory, uh, create an execution plan or even a cache execution plan to figure out how it's going to find each individual row. We're talking to a cache saying, I need exactly this data. And it's going to give me back exactly that data. There's nothing to query. It's just scanning through a dictionary going, oh, here's your data. There you go. Now, it might not just be Jenny. It might be a JSON string. It could be basically any serializable data that you want to have. 
And we'll walk through an example of this here in just a moment. Um, in ASP.NET Core, there are three built-in ways to do caching. Or basically, it's two ways, but then there's, yeah, there's a split. Um, you have, uh, and this is all in configure services, you can add memory cache. Memory cache is really good for local developments or things that a single individual server needs to track. Um, what I appreciate about memory cache is that you can put anything into a memory cache because it's local. It's, it's not going to an external service. Uh, you can, uh, so with memory cache, if we go back to our load balance scenario, I have multiple servers. Each of them are maintaining their own individual memory caches, which might be what you need uh, or might, might be just fine. But maybe then you need to move to a more distributed model. Uh, I have here add distributed memory cache, which is the same concept as add memory cache, but it's only for serializable data. Uh, and ser serializable meaning, let's think of it this way. Uh, you have, uh, can you serialize it to a string? So can you take an object, represent it in a string form and go, go back and forth? There are some objects in .NET that where you can't do that. So we need to, to make sure that's something that we can do. Uh, I'll use add memory cache for, for test applications. I don't use it in production. What I will use in production is distributed Redis cache. Uh, so add second change Redis cache is another built-in aspect to uh, ASP.NET Core. And what this does is what my previous slide was demonstrating. We have Redis cache sitting out here to the side. And anytime we do a lookup or we want to add something to the cache, it's going to this remote server and all servers can benefit from that. Uh, using the cache is as straightforward as just injecting the correct dependency. Um, so in anything in ASP.NET, uh, whether it's controller, your own services, you name it. If you inject an iMemory cache, it's going to give you that in memory cache to use. And the two fundamental concepts that you need to know with cache are gets and sets. So here we have a, uh, a set where I'm giving it the key. So here's the thing in the database uh, that I want to name my object. And here's the object I want to give you. And the cache will go through and create the, basically it's a big hash table. Uh, it says, all right, user 8675309 is this object. So later when we do a, uh, do a get and I ask him, well, do you have anything for the key user 8675309? It's just going to give me that object or it's going to give me null. And so if it doesn't exist at all, it's not going to error out. It's just going to tell me there's nothing there. So I need to make sure I'm doing the proper null checks when I'm pulling data from a cache or trying to pull data from a cache. Now the same concept works if you're working with I distributed cache, which is uh, if you or if you're doing distributed to a Redis cache. Uh, there's also uh, documentation for using things like in cache and other caching uh, mechanisms, but they all use I distributed cache as as kind of their interface. But the same concepts apply. And I just realized I'm not awaiting my two async calls here in, in the demo. Don't do as me, do it the proper way. But the same concept, you do set async, you do get async. And if you pass in an object, uh, it will serialize objects down to strings, put them in. You can also uh, serialize down to bytes and you can put bytes directly into the cache but it's a very straightforward mechanism for adding things to a cache and pulling data out of the cache. Um, and so for this demo, I, I wanted to work on an example that would make a lot of sense and show obvious caching. Um, so this is what I did. So I have a Pi, pi generation uh, example where I have a controller action. You tell it the number of digits of pi you want to iterate, you want to generate, and then how many iterations you want to go through to figure out, um, to see how precise you get those digits. And 
this actually works really well when you have the numbers correct because it takes some time to generate a, a couple thousand iterations of, of pi. But in this example, so as I'll show you startup CS first, uh, I'm not using memory cache, I'm not using distributed memory cache, I'm using Stack Exchange Redis. Uh, Redis is local in my Docker in instance. So I'm connecting to my local Stack Exchange or, or my local Redis. But anywhere I want to use distributed cache, I just inject I distributed cache. And now I have access to that cache anywhere I need it. Uh, inside of Go Async, we're going to set up a key and I can have multiple keys. And in this particular example, I want to be able to cache multiple iteration and digit combinations for, for pi. So if I'm calculating five digits versus 500 digits and 10 iterations versus 50 iterations, you know, I want to have different, uh, different cache values for all that stuff. So we create our key. And when this call gets executed for the first time, we're going to go check the cache. And I'm using uh, distributed caches returning byte arrays. You can also you can also get back strings. That works as well. Uh, now, if there's nothing in the cache, it's going to return null. So I do a quick null check, and if it's null, I have to go do the calculation. Uh, I stole some code from GitHub. Uh, it's referenced a little bit lower, and I'll go calculate pi for however many digits. When I get that result, uh, I can actually take it, put it into my cache using set. So set the value of pi 15, 10,000 to whatever my result was. And I can set time to live or expiration dates for any of this data. Because some caches, you don't want to live indefinitely. You want them to expire maybe after uh, 10 seconds or 10 minutes or a couple hours. Uh, you can play with this as much as you want to. And when that's all done, you return the result to the user, to the client. Let's run through this again. Check the cache. If there is something in the cache, we get back a byte array, which I can take that result and I can cast it to the proper data type. Uh, if it was JSON, I could cast it to a JSON object. Uh, you, you're basically taking the raw data from the cache and doing something. Uh, either as string or bytes. And this saves me from the time of having to iterate through all the different combinations. So I can just send the result back. Let me run the app. And this time, instead of using uh, Edge, I'm going to use um, Postman because we want to check this time here. I want to hit Send. And I'm making 20, I'm doing 25 digits over uh, 10,000 iterations. Takes a bit because what it's trying to do is it's trying to really nail down the uh, how accurate the number of digits are. And I like this example because it actually takes some time. So if this was your API in the back end, you're sitting there spinning to the user. You're like, All right, we're loading, we're saving, we're, we're doing work. Hold on a moment. And we wait, we play the Jeopardy music for, for those of you who know it. Uh, all right, so that came back, it took 44 seconds. All right, now anyone who comes in afterwards, we hit send, it comes back in 10 milliseconds or nine milliseconds or eight milliseconds or seven. So it comes back like that immediately because we don't have to do that recalculation. We already know the result, the results in cache. We pull it from the cache and we give it to the user. I have a Redis uh, tool here and zoom, zoom. You see, I have a, my sample. So this is my key. Um, so pi 25, 10,000. And now it's in here as bytes, but it could also be a string. And we know it's going to live for another 23 seconds before it's all, all gone. But 
Let's see, let's do a refresh. Is it still here? Yep, so it's still here. So in a moment, it will die and it, it won't live anymore. So that value goes away. If I were to hit send again, it's gonna take another 44, 45 seconds to recalculate these digits because we lost the value in cash. Well, not, so not only that, let me open another, another value here. Let's put in a slightly smaller. So 10,000, that comes back faster. A thousand, so nine seconds. And most of this time isn't talking to cash. It's just returning the result. If I go back to Redis, Oh, oh, did I not change that? Oops, okay, let me change that to 100. Because what I wanna show is multiple multiple values in here. And they all have different, different values. So different keys, different values, uh, everything's in cache. So anything that needs to go get this data again, it's getting it back immediately. Um, and in your application will be faster for it. So if you have data that changes not so often, put it in cache. I'm even an advocate for putting uh, data in cache that does change often because you can use TTLs, time to live, expiration dates, uh, or you can override the data in the cache if something changes. It's more beneficial to have it in cache, being able to quickly get to it, than it is to rely on some of your slower data access, uh, such as SQL Server or really any relational database. Uh, that's not optimized for reads in a, a broader sense. So I'm a huge advocate of using caching in your apps. Uh, and now in old ASP.NET, you used to have this concept of what is it, response cache. This is, that's a different subject altogether, um, which I think most people already know about because it's been in ASP.NET forever. Uh, we're talking specifically about data level caching here. But with that, I, I believe I am at over my time. Um, if you need the code for, for this, it's on my GitHub and it should be up to date. I'll double check it here in a moment. Uh, actually, let me go ahead and bring everything up here. I will answer any last minute questions anyone has. But thank you so much to my friends at JetBrains for, for letting me hang out with you today. Uh, it's been a pleasure and none of my demos failed. So, um, oh, we have a whole bunch of questions in here. Uh, well, actually maybe. <clears throat> uh, yeah, there's, there's a few, um, actually, so I have some questions too. No. So you, with caching, um, mm -hmm. this comes up quite a bit, how frequently you should refresh a cache. And I find it interesting. I think you're one of the few that actually say frequently cache or caching frequently changed data is a good practice. Yeah. But now that you explained it, this is a really great point because I don't think people do that. Uh, actually, I think a lot of people just kind of skip over uh, caching unless they're a bit of a specialist in that area. Yeah. So, Well, let's talk. So let's imagine you're in charge of your entire application. You know when data changes. Yep. Uh, so when you know about data changing, you could just update the cache at the same time. Um, right. Is, so if, if we're talking user data or we're talking, talking product inventory data, um, so go back to earlier example that I had. If I, I update the number of products in my inventory, well, I could update the cache with the new number of products. Right. And you know, to be safe, I can have uh, TTLs, like expiration dates, uh, expiration times on all that data. So I don't accidentally leave something in cache that shouldn't be in cache for long term. Right. That's a big mistake I see is, oh, I'll put something in cache that I don't expect to be in cache all the time. And right. if I don't expire it, like, well, why is my app not working the way that I expected to? <laughs> it's, right. it's because it's going to cache, not the database. Right. Uh, but I think, yeah, that is a great strategy because, you know, it is going to save a database round trip, even if it is updated frequently. So what? You have to do that round trip anyway. So, yeah, that makes great sense. Yep. 
Uh, so somebody uh, mentioned DRPC if you were going to talk about it, but maybe you could talk no. about the relationship between that and, say, Signal R and some of the other real-time uh, technologies out there. Yeah, uh, so DRPC, is, they're different beasts. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to be perfectly honest, I have not done my due diligence on DRPC, mainly because it's, it's still too new. Right? It's still... like they. I think this is where WebSockets was 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. let's see. WebSocket 2021, Curious Pines. Yeah. Eight, <laughs> <nine> years ago. <laughs> well, well, so, well, WebSockets was in this state where it was changing constantly. So if you were implementing WebSockets, it's because you hated yourself and <laughs> you wanted to deal with daily uh, breaking code. Um, and so you just didn't do that. It's, I see gRPC kind of in that it's a little bit more stable. It's more stable than WebSockets was a long time ago. Um, right. But I don't see it as a thing that I, I'm going to recommend people fully embrace yet. Right. Uh, but so RPC, remote procedure calls, it's kind of in the same, it's the same concept implemented differently. Um, and I wish I had more working knowledge of it. It's also a Google back standard, which I'm usually iffy of. Because Google right. loves to kill things left and right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's in beta forever, then it dies. Yeah, which like, I don't think gRPC is going to go that direction. But That's I wait. I'm going to wait until more people are embracing it, and then we'll jump on that bandwagon. But it, even the folks on the ASP.NET team have said, you know, Signal R is a different beast altogether. Right. It is much more stable. Uh, if you're looking at long-term longevity of your application, you're safer with Signal R. GRPC is probably a better direction if you need more low-level um, remote access, uh, remote procedure calls. Right. Yeah, the team, I was talking with my team earlier about the flux of new technology, and I said, yeah, I'm just getting too old for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's the constant changing is great to play around with, but you really can't put it in production or anything serious. So, yeah, I don't think it's there either. So. Uh, so on to you, somebody asked uh, Redis versus NCache, and I would say expand that to versus any distributed cache or yeah. uh, distributed memory management solution. What do you think? Uh, I would just say if you have any distributed cache is good. I've done a little bit with NCache in the past. Uh, it, it works just fine. It's a more, it's a more Windows-centric environment. Redis, Redis only works well on Linux. Um, so if you're a Windows user using Redis, you're either running Redis uh, externally or you're putting it in Docker. Uh, and that's how I run it. The window ports for Redis are not good or as good as they could be. Okay. Um, I, th I think actually you answered this from somebody else, but they're asking about SignalR using long polling. Uh, I could just go ahead and say it does when you need it to. It's a fallback. Um, yeah. WebSockets is preferred. And uh, what else do we have? Can you use cancellation tokens with cache? Uh, I believe that's an option when you're setting and getting. Uh, da, da, da. Come on, Ryder, give me some IntelliSense. Yes. So it's hard to hard to see. Let me zoom in. Yeah, you can pass in the cancellation token. Uh, and cool. that's with distributed. I believe with in memory. In memory. Crab, I don't remember. Uh, I don't think in memory is asynchronous because it doesn't need to be, um, because it's not writing to anything. It's just like, oh, I'm, I'm putting stuff in memory. So uh, when you're not doing that work asynchronously, you don't really have a need for cancellation token. But that was a good question. Uh, I don't right. use cancellation tokens as much as I should <laughs> in my app. Everybody has their thing. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. I have a lot of <laughs> Yeah, but look at all these great practices that you're doing and giving talks about anyway. So that more than balances it out, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I hope everyone learned something. That's, that's my I, goal. I think so. I think so. I certainly did. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice because I haven't done Signal R in a while. It's nice to have the little refresher. So Used to be part yeah. of our real-time army, Rachel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. 
yeah, I definitely have to get back into it. Uh, I've been doing a lot more on the side with Blazer, which kind of just has it magically built in. <laughs> you don't really have to do yeah. much. So it's that's a that's one of the big things I get in the course is people want to talk about Cigar in terms of Blazer. Um, right. I'm not on the Blazer train, so it's difficult for me to make it, to have some of those conversations. Um, I have my reasons. It's not for that. To, now is not the time. Right. Right. <laughs> a whole different conversation yeah so, so okay uh let's see i don't see uh any other questions so i guess that can wrap it up all righty so thanks for coming on kevin this was pretty great yeah, uh so for you, for you viewers out there you can go to jetbrains.com slash rider for more information on rider and blog.jetbrains.com slash dot net and of course, our YouTube channel here and Twitter, we're at Jeff Brains Writer and Kevin's page, which is Consulting with Griff. And thanks for joining. Don't forget to subscribe, do all that social networking, like smashing the like button and all that hip cool kid stuff. And thanks again. We'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.